Well, good afternoon, everybody. While people find a square foot of carpet to sit on, um, and there are still some here, <laughs> Um, let me take this opportunity to welcome everybody to our first View from the Top talk of the seminar. And it's wonderful to see such a fantastic um, turnout, which, of course, we shouldn't have been surprised about, given um, how distinguished today's speaker is. Um, I'm Fiona Doyle. I'm the Executive Associate Dean in the College of Engineering. And in fact, I'm a former colleague of ICAS as well. So I'm particularly thrilled um, at, 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 um, at this opportunity. Before we get started, um, could I just remind everybody to put their phones on um, silent mode so that we aren't interrupted by um, any annoying phone calls? And I um, have a little bit of housekeeping um, just before we get started. Um, and the first most important thing is to thank the Material Science and Engineering Association um, for their joint sponsorship of this event. Um, you um, got lunch from the MSEA um, students out there um, who are very pleased to be part of this effort. So um, thanks to all the students who made this possible. Um, in addition, I've got a couple of um, sort of commercials for um, other things that are going on in the college. This is the first of our View from the Top um, lectures. Um, every year we have a few um, distinguished speakers who can um, give you their perspective as leading thinkers on technology innovation um, and being a driving force um, behind um, this and supporting education. Um, the next college-wide talk that we will be having, which is sort of part of the view from the top, although it's also going to be our MINA lecture for the year, is going to be on October the 9th, when Wayne Clough, who's the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution and also an alumnus of our civil program, will be um, speaking at 3.30 in Sibley Auditorium. And another event that many people may be interested in is on October the 11th, the College of Engineering will host Cal Alumni at our homecoming um, celebration. And from 9 to 10, we'll be having a, pan a faculty and student panel discussion on women in innovation making an impact. Um, that's going to be um, in, I believe, the... Well, actually, I don't have the venue for that, so um, stay tuned for that. Um, so um, with that, I would like now to turn to introducing um, Ike, Weg Ike Weber. So um, it's quite apparent to me, I was sitting here listening to former colleagues greeting Ike, um, so um, I don't need to tell um, this group that we remember him very fondly as a long-term member of the Material Science and Engineering faculty and a researcher at um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, he, for over almost three decades, he um, led research and teaching um, on semiconductors here and um, did some very, very elegant work um, in terms of um, making um, semiconductors um, more powerful and um, energy efficient. In, um, I think it was 2007, it was 2007, he accepted the offer to become the, um, the director of the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, and of course, um, those, of us, those of us who know him know that he's a native of Germany, so it was a bit of a um, returning home, but he still um, maintains a home in Napa, which is why we were able to um, encourage him to take some time off from his vacation to come and um, share his wisdom with us. So we're very lucky that he was willing to interrupt his vacation for that. Um, and at the University of Freiburg, um, Dr. Weber also um, holds appointments as professor of physics and of solar energy. Um, in his laboratory, he's especially interested in producing high quality solar cells from upgraded metallurgical silicons without using chlorine based chemicals. He, um, as I said, even before he went to Freiburg, um, I was very, very impressed um, reading reports of some of the work that he was doing to make um, silicon much m less expensive for solar applications. He did some really, really elegant work um, 
I'm not, not that I'm a fan of it or anything, but I thought it was really awesome work. Um, um, before um, he left for Germany, um, Ike also co-founded CalSolar, which is now um, Silica, which is a manufacturer of new kind of solar silicon. Among his many honors and awards, he most recently received the um, Zayed Future Energy Prize on behalf of the Fraunhauer um, Institute that, um, and is endowed with 1.5 million um, from the Crown Prince of um, Abu Dhabi. Um, so that's a nice prize to receive, um, even if it's on behalf of your institute. Uh, it attests to um, the, the quality of work um, that, I that is done um, there. Um, he's also been so, um, honored with the Solar World Einstein Award and the Alexander von Humboldt Prize. So without further ado, I'd ask you all to provide a very, very warm welcome to Ike Weber. And welcome back. Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you. <laughs> Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is such a big pleasure to be back here in Berkeley. And of course, it is a special pleasure to be introduced by Fiona Doyle, a very dear friend. I think we both started in 1983 as assistant professors here in Berkeley. We went together skiing together with our dear friends, the late Gareth Thomas and uh, with Jim Evans, who is still uh, kicking. And uh, we had a great time together in so many years. And I must say, if it would not have been this unique opportunity to be the director of the institute in Freiburg, uh, I would probably, st most probably still be here because uh, very few things can lure you away from a place like Berkeley. So I think uh, we all agree on that. So let me show you a few data uh, about this institute. Uh, as all Fraunhofer institutes, it's an institute which basically has to find its own funding. We get only a small percentage in last year, it was 16% of our budget, which is already now in the order of dollar 100 million, 86 million euros. Uh, and we have to make sure that about one third of this budget is raised from industry. So this is the rule. First of all, the institute has to have enough money to pay the salaries. And secondly, it has to have one third from industry. And this is a very, very powerful business model because it really makes sure that all the 66 institutes, all the 22,000 people working in the 66 institutes in Germany are really focused on cutting edge but really application-ready research. Because otherwise, I always say, you can easily convince a bureaucrat who has to dish out public funding that what you are going to do is the biggest and the best and for society and so on. But to convince the CEO of a company to give you money and not to spend it inside the company, this is a tough task. And there is no nonsense possible and you can only succeed if you have cutting edge research results available. Because if you don't have this, why should the company go through the labor of dishing out research money outside the company? So this is why this is so very powerful. And uh, honestly speaking, when I came to Freiburg, I noticed, well, this is just like running my group here in Berkeley. We had almost, we had practically no basic funding. We had to take care for getting the funding and only now the level was bigger. When I came to Freiburg, the institute had 490 people and we had a 25 million euro budget. So it was possible in this eight years to really get almost triple the size uh, we had at that time, which you could never do with a government laboratory. Go to the government and say, please double the size of my institute. They will only laugh at you. But if it's your own money and if you earn your own money, you can just do it. So Fraunhofer really has a very powerful model, uh, model in this. We are not just located in uh, um, Freiburg. We have places as well in different places in Germany, in Gelsenkirchen, in Freiburg and Halle. And when I came, I immediately realized that what we are doing there is very, very relevant for the United States. But at that time, I didn't have a student of mine here on the faculty who would be an anchor person for a lab in the uh, United States, but a former student of mine, Tonio Bonassisi, was assistant professor at MIT. Today he got tenure at MIT, so we founded our Center for Sustainable Energy Systems at MIT. But as a matter of fact, actually now we are in very active discussions if we cannot do something as well together with LBL, together with campus uh, here on the West Coast. So, Let's see what will come out of that. The Institute has a very broad scope. I would call it 
technologies for the transformation of the energy system. So you see, it's not just photovoltaics, also photovoltaics and solar energy harvesting as well, solar thermal, is about half of our activities. But the other half has to do with storage issues, with distribution, <coughs> building efficiency, and therefore it's almost easier to say what we are doing by saying what we are not doing. We are not working on wind energy. There's another Fraunhofer Institute who does wind energy. We are not working on geothermal, tidal, and some of the smaller areas but most of the other areas you need for the fundamental transformation of the energy system is really uh, at home in this uh, institute. So what is the reason that we need such a radical transformation of our energy system? Jeremy Rifkin, whom you might have heard about, uh, calls this the third industrial revolution. The first one was in the 19th century, the second one came with information technology, and the third one is now changing our system to a long-term sustainable system. This is really at the core of it. And it will be the first step to transform to living in a sustainable way. There is limited availability of fossil fuels, and even if the fossil fuels with shale uh, and fracking can last some 20, 30 years longer, it is clear that they are limited, and therefore uh, sooner or later we have to change to sustainable things. And of course, uh, if we want to take the big task of changing the whole world to sustainability, we should start in the corner of energy, because in energy we have a second issue besides the limited availability of fossil and nuclear sources, and this is we are facing the clear and present danger to change our climate system in a very, very uh, uh, how should I say, undetermined way. I always say we make a gigantic experiment with planet Earth by changing the composition of our atmosphere. We call it global warming, but the global warming part is, in my view, the least dangerous part. The big danger is changing fundamentals of the climate system, undermining the stability of the climate system, and therefore uh, 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 this is really the task which we have to, to do first. So changing the energy system to a sustainable energy system I see always as the first step in the big transformation to sustainability. Is there a light switch? Yeah, because it's failing. Yeah, that's, that's probably yeah. better. Yeah, thank you. Nuclear energy was perceived to be the way out, and there are still people today who think so, but in reality it is not, because basically a nuclear power plant is a very, very complex machinery. We can control complex machineries as long as we know the starting conditions from which to model how these complex machines behave, but there are always starting conditions which we are not aware of. And I always like to use the example of the space shuttle. The space shuttle is probably the most careful designed piece of hard work humans ever perceived. Everything double and triple safety. But nobody constructing the space shuttle thought about that at cold temperatures the O-rings of the booster rockets might not be tight. Nobody thought about that the styrofoam part which insulates the hydrogen tanks might fall down during the start and damage the critical front wing. Nobody thought that an, uh, a nuclear power plant might have a simultaneous failure of the external power supply and the failure of the emergency pumps, because this is what brought down Fukushima. It was not the tidal wave, it was not the earthquake. The, nuclear power plant in Fukushima Daiichi survived tidal wave and earthquake, but it didn't survive the simultaneous failure of outside power and of the emergency power systems. I always say if it would have had a solar roof providing 100 kilowatt of electric power, the danger, the, the accident might have run quite differently. So in all cases, in any complex system humans can think about, we are fundamentally unable to think about all possible cases that can happen, and therefore we should run the space shuttle. There we endanger only the poor people sitting in the space shuttle, but having a task uh, like uh, for some days, we didn't know how the winds were blowing in Japan, and there was the danger of having to evacuate Tokyo. And how do we evacuate 30 million people? I mean, they could uh, only uh, jump in the ocean. So this is not the way out. 
The unstable regions in the world are all the regions which have to do with fossil fuels, as we know. And I think the more we get and the faster we get independent of that, uh, the better. And the new issue, and I will say something about this in my talk, is now we start to see clear economic advantages. We see new industry, new innovation coming into the game, and therefore we see the possibility uh, of really making this not just a burden for our generation, but a real great opportunity for the future. And of course, we should feel responsible to do it because our industrialized countries are the ones who have changed the composition of the atmosphere in the first place. So this is the task we should really take up. Why do we need this? I already mentioned the world will have to switch back from the current non-sustainable way Business as usual is simply not an option if we want to live for a few hundred more years on this planet in the way we all like to live in a technology world. Actually, I like to refer to Kant. Kant said a very wise word, his categorical imperative, actually every person should have fundamental principles for his life which could be applied by all other people so that we can really live together in a world together. And I think one should just modify Kant a little bit. All generations on this planet should live in a way that future generations are able to live under the same principles. So Kant <coughs> is not only valid for the life of one generation, Kant as well applies for future generations. We have the responsibility to live in a way that future generations have still the chance to live in the same way. And of course, uh, if we only would look at the availability of fossil and nuclear resources, I fully agree that we still have several decades to go till we take up the task, but because of the problem of the climate and actually uh, the geologists are now debating whether we should not call the end of the Holocene, which was the last 11,000 years of the Earth, in which the Earth's climate actually was extraordinarily stable. And this allowed humans to change from being hunters and gatherers to now making agriculture, to form states. Everywhere on this planet, be it in China, be it in Middle America, be it in Europe, you go back and everything what we see around us started in this Holocene because of the climate stability gave the principle for life. And actually what we are right now making are the experiment to change this climate stability by changing the composition of the atmosphere. And what really all can help come upon us, we don't know yet. I am personally very afraid that the worst things that might happen are not even among on our radar screen. Changes of the monsoon cycle, changes of the strongest storms, you know, one storm with a 250 uh, wind speed uh, miles per hour can ruin your day quite considerably. So I think uh, this is really what we should try to avoid. So the cornerstones is, first of all, any energy we don't need is good energy. So let's start with energy efficiency in building, production and transport. However, even with all energy efficiency, it is clear the world needs energy, needs useful energy, and therefore we have to massively increase harvesting renewable energies, photovoltaic, solar, geothermal, wind, everything where we can get it. The development of the electric grid has to deal with the fact that suddenly electricity will go backwards. If you create decentralized photovoltaic or wind-based power, suddenly in certain areas there's too much electric power, so we need to make the electric grid bidirectional and connect it so that we can connect the regions where we can harvest renewable energy the best. We need storage because the sun doesn't shine in the night and the wind, of course, is not blowing continuously, so these new sources of useful energy of electricity uh, need to be connected to storage systems to allow us to have power around the clock. The interconnection with the grid and the demand for storage are complementary things. So if you don't have a grid like you live on an island, you need a lot of storage because you have to get everything in the night from your storage. If you are in a well interconnected system, then you can of course transport electricity and uh, you are able to reduce the amount of storage, but this will be part of the game. And of course, we have as well to think about how to convert the mobility sector to a renewable uh, supply 
uh, which can be by battery powered cars or by hydrogen fuel cell cars. So this picture here shows our solar hydrogen station in Freiburg. Actually, this is the car I am driving since one and a half years. It's a fuel cell car. I've driven more than 10,000 miles with it and I drive freely with the energy of the sun because the PV system converts uh, sunshine to electricity. The electrolyzer makes hydrogen. It is compressed to 700 bars. So it is really possible to drive 100% renewable in a way we are used to driving. And I have a range of about uh, 250 miles. I have a take time to, take, uh, to fill the tank less than five minutes because I only have to fill three kilograms of hydrogen and three kilograms of hydrogen at 700 bar. It's done in a snap in comparison to filling up a normal gas tank. So hydrogen powered uh, electric mobility will be part of the future system. Germany has done a good job in going ahead since about 2000. We had the renewable energy law and you see how the addition of renewables in addition to hydro, which was always present, has really gone off very quickly. We have now uh, in the year 2013, 25.4 of our electricity from renewables. You always have to distinguish whether it's a fraction of the total primary energy or if it's a fraction of electricity. So in electricity, we are now uh, in 2014 approaching 30%. But in total primary energy, we are still in the 10 to 15 percent range. So there's still quite a lot to be done. Let's have a look at the size of the resources the world has in energy. This is a beautiful graphic I got uh, from uh, Dr. Paris from SUNY Albany. And uh, let me uh, go with you together. So the circles we are going to see are sized by energy. So the world's energy <coughs> supply right now requires 16 terawatts of average power. This means 16 terawatt years per year of energy. And this is the size here. And we expect that if we are uh, introducing energy efficiency means, despite the growth of the world economy till 2050, we might be able to limit the total energy demand to 28 terawatts so that we need 28 terawatt years to supply it. And as a matter of fact, we have lots of energy supplies. Take alone what we have in coal, 900 terawatt years, which shows coal alone can cover us for quite a few decades. Oil, natural gas, these are all big sizes compared to what we need. This is out of uranium. But still, if you divide uh, these numbers by 15 and 28, you come out with quite limited numbers. You know, a few decades, we can still go ahead uh, with these finite sources. But not, let's look at the renewable sources. The renewable sources, wind alone, we could harvest 60 to 120 terawatt years each year. So wind alone could cover actually the needs the world has in total energy. Waves help, other technologies help, biomass, hydro, geothermal, tides, all of this are helpful. But all of these renewables completely pale when compared to what the sun is giving us continuously. 23,000 terawatt years easy to harvest solar energy. So the total solar energy on Earth is about 10 times this number, but this is a number which we can easily harvest. So it really doesn't need a rocket scientist to predict down the road, if we are looking 100 years down the road, we will really use harvesting the solar energy in order to fulfill the energy needs which we have. We might have a worldwide super grid to bring electricity from where it can be harvested to the place uh, where it is needed. But this is really the way ahead. And this we should keep in mind. And even if we change here the numbers to include the shale gas, you see a little bit larger bubbles. But in principle, it doesn't change the picture that down the road, we have to rely on what is continuously available in the form of renewable energy. And solar will be a big Question player. Question. Yes? Is the energy efficiency uh, accounted? Uh, yes, the energy efficiency, if we don't do anything about energy efficiency, the energy demand of the world might uh, triple by 2050. Uh, in solar and everything else, if you include efficiency. Energy conversion. Uh, 
No, this is a power which comes to Earth. You have to multiply it by 0.2 in order to get really what you get with today's technology. Because energy efficiency is a very variable thing, you know. No, yeah, I mean, the main argument that solar is so much larger than all the others is not changed by a factor 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you know, absolutely not. So uh, I think it makes no sense to put here efficiency because each year we progress with technology, we improve the efficiency of harvesting these energies. Actually, right now I will show you the data we have at my institute, the world record 44.7% photovoltaic energy conversion. Um, I, I guess maybe we will have a discussion at the end of the talk. I have you have a, a nuclear um, silver over there. The uranium, yes. Yes, yeah, in the interest of time, right. we'll, have, we'll have a question and answer at the end. Yes, I, I, I really appreciate uh, your questions. So now let's come, how do we harvest solar energy with photovoltaics? We do it by crystalline silicon technology. This shows the technology mix in photovoltaic solar cells and you see, some time ago, we had about one third of solar cells made out of so-called thin film, amorphous silicon, and other thin film technologies. However, right now, we are back in about 85 to 90 percent of crystalline silicon in the two modifications, single crystalline silicon, highest efficiency, slightly higher costs, or so-called multi-crystalline silicon, which you can produce in large quantities by making directional solidification of big uh, containers of molten silicon, uh, this is really uh, the photovoltaic technology. And really the biggest and most important message is costs of photovoltaic electricity have come down incredibly by more than a factor of 10 in the last uh, decades. When we started in the 1980s, we need to pay more than 10 euros per watt. I'm sorry that we are using uh, euros per watt here, you know the factor. But the point is, since that time, the world is following a continuous learning curve which each doubling of the total accumulated uh, installation, we see a 20% decrease of the module prices. And as a matter of fact, this relationship was already declared dead in these years. This was the years 2006, 2008, when there was such a demand worldwide that you could not produce PV fast enough. And therefore, although we were progressing on the total acc accumulated production, prices did not go down because simply uh, the demand was larger than the production. Now we are in the opposite situation. Now we have an overproduction capacity. As you now might know, the Chinese have set up gigantic production of solar cells, about double the capacity the world needs at the moment. And therefore, what happened is the price is at the moment below the learning curve. And therefore, we can quite uh, with quite confidence suggests that in the next couple of years we expect no more falling prices till we have something of the order of 600 gigawatt installed worldwide. At the moment worldwide installations are at 130 gigawatt and therefore uh, the prices might remain stable till we really again hit the learning curve and we come further down. But uh, it means that the cost of electricity in a country like Germany, and Germany has the same solar insulation as Alaska, we have come down to magnitudes of 10 to 15 euro cent per kilowatt hour. You can compare it with the price of household electricity in Germany, which is about 28, 29 cent per kilowatt hour. So in Germany already, although we have such little sunshine, Everybody can put a solar system in the roof and produce solar electricity at half the cost than what it would cost to get it out of the grid. And as a matter of fact, I brought with for you a concrete graph. This is a company, uh, a medium-sized company, Keiko. They are in the area of inverter technology. This is the electricity demand in a summer day last year, 2013. You see there is a certain electricity demand overnight. 30 kilowatt of power, then people come and start to work and this is in the peak and this is the next night. And this company went ahead without any subsidies and we don't have an investor tax credit in Germany and installed a solar system, two megawatts and they needed to pay for this two million euros. 
And this is now what they have to get out of the grid. So their PV system covers their needs during the day. They still have, of course, uh, needs in the night and at the morning peak before the sun comes up. But in terms of the, uh, in terms of the investment, they have invested 2 million euros and they save annually on the electricity bill 350,000 euros. So for this, you don't need any support scheme, market support, nothing. And these type of numbers you can get worldwide more and more. This is the real reason that the global PV market keeps growing so rapidly because it's getting more and more simply economically the right thing to do to replace daytime electricity needs by solar. And if you want to go further and you want to have your nighttime, you have to add, of course, storage. And in solar technology, even in crystalline silicon technology that was considered by many people as a boring research area, nothing happens. We still have many technology generations ahead. At the moment, 80 to 90 percent of crystalline silicon PV is made with an aluminum backside, with a front side silver contacts, all using the standard technology. We have many technology generations, which I cannot explain here in the short time, but my point is just this is still a very active research field. This is not yet a commodity. It is a high-tech product and these new technology generations which offer higher efficiencies at lower cost, they are now coming into the production and will keep us busy for quite some time to come. However, photovoltaics is not just silicon. Silicon has a big advantage if you look at the solar spectrum. This is the solar spectrum and this is what you can harvest with silicon. First of all, silicon has a band gap of 1.1 electron volts, so all light with photon energy below this or with wavelengths longer than this will pass through silicon. Silicon is transparent for this light. Near the band edge, you are converting solar light with practically 100% efficiency into electricity. But if you go to higher photon energies, even a photon of two electron volt energy can create only an electron hole pair of one electron volt power. So in other words, you are losing about half of the energy here. And altogether, theoretically, with silicon, the limit is somewhere at 28, 29%. We are now producing solar cells of about 25% as lab record, but this is still very limited. What can we do to go to higher efficiency? We would like to harvest the solar spectrum much more efficient. And the uh, approach which really works is to use different semiconductor materials with different band gaps so that the top material has the largest band gap. It is transparent for all the light which has a photon energy below 1.7 eV. This is then harvested by the next layer and the germanium substrate can harvest the remainder. And there are of course many schemes. This is just an example scheme which we have used uh, in, in um, ESA in order to do it. However, such a structure is extremely complicated, is extremely expensive to make. It is a structure which is at least as complex as making a semiconductor laser with many, many thin films which have to be deposited by molecular beam epitaxy or by metallorganic uh, chemical vapor deposition and therefore much too expensive to harvest solar energy on Earth. Actually, these type of structures were developed for space application because if you need electricity for a satellite, you ask how many watts do you get per kilogram of payload and you don't ask what did you pay for it because the payload and the weight is what is the expensive part of it. On Earth you must make a trick and this trick is quite easy to make. You take a big wafer where you have made this structure, divide it in thousand tiny solar cells like uh, two by two square millimeters, put it under a collecting lens or put it in the focus of a collecting mirror and concentrate the light of a large area onto that small uh, place of the solar cell. And then you convert this light of the large area with the same efficiency as uh, uh, this uh, uh, offers. And as a matter of fact, if one looks at these pictures, the efficiency increases with the concentration. There is physics behind it. Each solar cell has a certain amount of flaws of recombination channels where you lose energy. But if you increase the number of photons, 
you simply flood the semiconductor with carriers and then the relative importance of the non-radiative recombination goes down. So you always have a maximum and of course if you go to even higher concentration you have to worry for the heat which you generate and if you have a certain structure with a certain heat management you get a maximum. And this is the actual world record solar cell 44.7% efficiency and this is done with a wafer bonded four junction technology cell. So this cell contains an artificially made interface. Basically two cells were grown on two different substrates and then baked together in a very clean way in order to create this record cell. And this type of approach, this wafer bonding approach, will definitely allow us to go further towards 50%. The theoretical limit is 60% of these multi-junction cells. So there are still lots to be done and therefore it's difficult to put one efficiency value at what we have. And this type of technology has to follow the sun. We have to put it on so-called two-axis tracking systems as it is shown here and it allows to use the space in between for cattle for agriculture so it has as well advantages in the third world for dual use of the scarce uh, land resources. And uh, we have made a spin-off out of my institute, a company called Concentrix, which was taken over by the French company Soitec. Soitec has now built a 300, uh, is now in the process of building a 300 megawatt uh, concentrating PV installation near San Diego, and they have built a factory right next to the site. So this is completely new technology. This is not yet in the gigawatt scale than the numbers which I showed you for silicon photovoltaics. Here we are still talking about megawatt scale, but I think a very exciting technology for sun-rich countries. This is not useful for Germany. In Germany we have cloudy skies and therefore we can never harvest enough energy. This is good for all countries where we have left of blue sky conditions, direct solar uh, illumination. How is, where is the solar market going? I really love to show this very old slide, which is from the November 2010 from Sarazin Bank. And in 2010, the world PV market had a volume of about 17 gigawatt annual installations. And Sarazin in 2010 dared to predict that the world market till 2020 might go up to 100, 110 gigawatt annual market size. And at that time, this was considered an amazingly optimistic prediction because already the 17 gigawatt was considered a huge amount. You see there were years of very high growth rates in order to reach this value. And Sarazin predicted 2014, we might have a world market of 30 gigawatt, 2020 of 110 gigawatt. The world market in 2014 will exceed 45 gigawatt. So the world market in 2014 will be 50% higher than the Sarazin prediction. And therefore, I conclude that Sarazin, which at that time was considered an optimistic prediction, is indeed a conservative prediction. The number for 2020 might be even much above 100 gigawatt. And this means if today the world market is 45 gigawatt, what we have in front of us is doubling and tripling of this world market size in the years to come. Even the quite conservative International Energy Agency in Paris, which only slowly has come to realize that there is this fundamental, gigantic change of the world energy system to renewables. They already said that 2050, we might have a few thousand gigawatt of photovoltaic installations. And driven, of course, by the rapidly declining costs, by the learning curve, which I have shown you. So definitely it is clear that this market size will quickly grow to much larger values. As a matter of fact, I have estimated if only 10% of our energy demand in 2050 should be covered from harvesting solar photovoltaics, we need installations of 10,000 gigawatt. And we never come to 10,000 gigawatt if we annually produce 45 gigawatt. We will very quickly see this market grow to 100 gigawatt, to 300 gigawatt. Even with a 300 gigawatt annual market, you need 30 years till you have 10,000 gigawatts installed. So this is what we have in front of us. And therefore, we need 
construction of new gigawatt scale highly automatic PV production plants. And what we have right now, which is the big imbalance between production capacity, these are these green columns, and the world market, which are the red columns, this will change in the next years fundamentally when the overproduction capacity is gone, when the world market has grown, and suddenly you see there is a very interesting balance. 2017, 2018, we will all scramble to find new production capabilities of this technology. So there is a very exciting and dynamic market coming along. Even the Deutsche Bank says this will be the second gold rush because what is going here on here is easy to estimate because if we can create solar electricity at 10 cents in Germany, at 5 cents, in, in Germany this is euro cents, so this would be 13 dollar cents. In, uh, uh, in, in the Middle Eastern or Southern United States countries for five cents per kilowatt hour. Down the road we are going towards two and three cents per kilowatt hour. There will be no limit to the further growth of this technology. And actually I try to push in Europe, uh, yes, thank you Fiona, I push in to try in Europe uh, construction of a new type of PV factory which is a European consortium which encompasses innovation in the technology as well as in production technology in order to make lowest cost but highest quality photovoltaic modules possible. I will speed up a little bit or skip some slides. I wanted to compare the learning curve with other technologies. This 20% slope is larger than the slope of uh, solar thermal power plants as well as wind power. Solar thermal power plants have just the possibility you can store the heat and therefore you can harvest solar energy during the day, run the turbines during the night and therefore you can indeed make solar uh, power supply 24 hours around the day. You can of course augment the solar energy by wind. In Germany this works very well. This is a comparison for the months of the year 2012 and you see how nicely in winter time we have more wind, in summer time we have more solar, but altogether we can harvest a similar amount of energy throughout the year combining wind and solar. So the combination of these different renewable energies are of course what makes sense. Then we need to add storage. This is a simulation which shows where storage has to come into the play in order to be able to make around uh, the clock uh, supply and altogether we should have the mix of renewable energy, we should expand the distribution grid, we should expand the high voltage grid, smart grid in order to make demand side management possible where consumption follows the generation and of course so storage decentralized storage, the battery system in your own home can secure that you almost can cover all your electricity needs from your own photovoltaic system on the roof. But of course as well large storage, thermal storage in Germany where we need a lot of energy for heat, it makes sense to store solar heat from the summertime into the winter time, the so-called seasonal storage. So altogether this is summarized here where the German uh, system looks like and we have developed a comprehensive model to really answer the question, can a highly industrialized country like Germany be supplied by close to 100% renewables? And as time is short, let me just show you, yes, it can be done. We analyzed all the 8,760 hours of a year. We looked at electricity, at heat and at the gas uh, consumption and we made a cost optimized system and the final result is uh, going through the, uh, going through the um, iterations with different models. Uh, if we make the lowest cost module we need a lot of solar, about 150 gigawatt solar, 120 gigawatt wind and all the other numbers are shown here. Solar thermal has to be here, uh, combined cycle uh, production where you produce not only heat but as well electricity. Heat pumps are very attractive in Germany because of the heating needs, heat storage, stationary batteries, all of this was included and the result is yes we can do it, we have to invest a lot of money, the estimate is about 500 billion dollars uh, euros till 2050 but the comparison to the saved money 
And this is dependent, of course, on the anticipated increases of fossil fuels, even if you have 0% increase, but even larger if the fuel prices continue to grow, the numbers which we get till 2050, we have to invest 500 billion, but we can get between 600 and 1000 billions already in savings, not spent money for fuel costs and so on. So it is absolutely the economical reasonable thing to undertake this transformation of the energy system. And as a matter of fact, Germany and California are two economies which are just a factor of two apart. So everything what I say for Germany, you can divide by a factor two and you see it for <coughs> California. So the basic message is, yes, we have to take up additional costs now, but then we have the cost savings of the future compared to business as usual. These are the investments and these are then the larger cost savings because the cost savings will of course continue into the future. So the faster we start, and in Germany we are already here, the faster we reach this crossover point where we can then enjoy the savings from the transformation. Maybe I will be very quickly, I have designed an index to measure our progress on the way to the energy transformation, horizontal axis, fraction of renewables in the energy consumption, vertical axis is energy efficiency, dividing the gross national product by the primary energy consumption. Germany from 1950 went backwards in the fraction of renewables because in the old days we had lots of uh, electricity from water. This was not sufficient, so we went backwards with coal and nuclear power plants. In 1973, oil crisis, we started to take energy efficiency seriously went upwards and now we are going on our way towards the final goal up there and we made an index out of it which is just simply the average of the uh, dimensional number for the energy efficiency and the fraction of renewable energies so you get points 100 points would be you have succeeded in the energy transformation and here are different countries so for instance you see china is following just what germany has done since 1950 and has just started to move upwards the united states is on a point 18 germany right now has 30 points that means even germany has only one third of the way to the transformation here are these bubbles shown switzerland for instance is very fortunate because a lot of the energy is coming from hydro and therefore they have a, a good position and the swiss economy is more based on finance and not on production so they get an advantage in terms of what we call energy efficiency. Germany is here, United States is here, but what is very interesting, California actually is very close to the United States on an index 28. So California and Germany, we have one third of the way done, two thirds are still ahead of us. And here you see the comparison of the different countries of the world, but most important is to see the growth, the change of this index, and we will follow this in the future. And we have formed an initiative, Go 100%, where we try to collect countries, regions, cities, which are ready to go on this way. We need, of course, energy policy. I have not to emphasize that it is all not possible without having a consensus of where we have to go. But the challenges are, of course, the fluctuations, the uh, new business models which are needed. So this is all what we have in front of us. So the final slide. The global energy transformation I consider as the challenge of our generation, as the first step of our complete transformation to sustainability. A hundred, near 100% 100 energy system is possible at similar costs, but we must invest a lot in innovation, research, technology development, manufacturing in order to make it possible. But after these investments, we have much larger savings lying ahead. The needed technologies are all available. There is no showstopper that we say without this innovation we can never go this way. But we need much work for higher efficiency technologies at lower production cost. And this is really the big task ahead for all of us, the big challenge. We have to face that challenge to bring these exciting innovations into the market fast enough. And the strong bridge across the valley of death the kind of work like we do it at Fraunhofer, this is really an important part in order to succeed. And politics needs to be bold and visionary. 
we have to explain the obvious advantages and we don't have to explain only climate change. If we tell people the change to sustainability is unavoidable anyway, the discussion is only should we start now and maybe potentially avoid the biggest dangers of the climate issue or do we wait till we have used our, our fo uh, fossil fuel. So this is really the point and the developments, the technologies are really a economic stimulus program of global scale. So thank you so much for your attention and my final picture, this is what I had in January. It was a big pleasure. Thank you. I am optimist. Here and I'm actually confident that we'll get over this. Yes. Um, so we now have time for questions. Thank you for hurrying to make sure that um, we make a point of prioritizing student questions um, in these presentations. But I'm not seeing any student hands, so um, OK. <laughs> yes, you are the youngest student, Very Richard. What I would like to hear is uh, what is the view, uh, just across your border, I mean, in, in France, where, where nuclear is very big, and, uh, and uh, do you have... Uh, controversy back and forth on which way to go? As a matter of fact, a very good question. Uh, the kind of consortium which I have sketched with only one slide would be a German-French-Swiss uh, consortium. And actually the French government is very interested to cooperate because they see as well that this is where the future is going. So they don't want to say anything negative about nuclear energy for obvious reasons, but they see the, op the, the possibilities. Just take the example, the French company Total was a company which took over SunPower, which was a crown jewel of PV companies here in the United States. So the French you know it's a socialistic type of country, they can transfer basic visionary ideas more easily into industry policy as in countries like Germany or United States, but they are not stupid, they are knowing uh, uh, where, where the wind is going. Oh yeah, let me see, I, I don't actually know myself where France is, let's have a look. Let me see, where do we have France? I yeah, so France has a similar value, has only 80% uh, change. United States had a change of 100% from 1990 to 2011, and uh, Germany had even 170% uh, change. Because you must uh, keep in mind, this index is not fair, because this index, the efficiency part, is based on the question, what is the structure of the economy? When it's not much production, you don't have much energy demand, even for a high national product. So what is more interesting, looking at the growth rates, how does the index change? That tells you really whether the development is going in the right direction. Hi, uh, my name is Andy. I'm a PhD student in, mecha in mechanical engineering. Uh, from Hi. your vantage point of view, regarding further cost reduction in PV technology, yes. uh, where can it be further reduced? Because sometimes you hear people in the industry say that currently the standard PV, crystalline silicon PV, is already very simple and uh, they already reached the bottom of the cost. No. And also, you see, sometimes you see some of the companies, they closed down or scaled back their R&D for those solar companies. So from your vantage point, um, what are the potentials for further cost reduction? So uh, even in crystalline silicon technologies, there are still enormous potentials for cost reductions. Factor two and three is absolutely on the drawing board. Of course, in the past 10, 20 years, people have always used the argument which you uh, referred to that crystalline silicon technology is old technology, we should start something completely new. But then you had these disasters like Solyndra, which was a pretty crazy approach to, to cover glass tubes with thin film uh, photovoltaic absorber material. And of course, they got a lot of money because it was a 
a very fascinating visionary idea, but it really didn't pan out in manufacturing and so on. So crystalline silicon technology has the advantage of being on the shoulders of the old microelectronic semiconductor manufacturing technology. And you know Moore's law and you know how enormously we were able to bring down costs in making uh, uh, integrated circuits. And actually, we of course don't make smaller structures because we need the areas, but in order to of the performance performance increase and the cost coming down, we definitely follow a similar curve as Moore's law. So yes, there are many possibilities which are based not only on bringing down cost, but as well bringing up efficiencies. So today we talk about uh, solar cells on the market of the 18 to 20 percent efficiency range. In a few years you will see the 20 to 25 percent efficient cells and higher efficiency of course goes directly in the lower cost per watt. So there is still a lot to be done in crystalline silicon technology. We still should research the completely new areas. I didn't talk about organic PV, completely different approaches. These will work if we have a big breakthrough. But without, in the absence of these breakthroughs and breakthroughs you can never uh, plan for, uh, crystalline silicon technology will remain for 20, 30 years, I'm sure. I think there's one last question back um. Hello, Marcus. It's working. Marcus Lehmann, a PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, reading the current clean tech news, um, they mention a, a major drawback in CSP on the economical side. Yes. So where do you see the future of CSP? Does yeah, it CSP is dead in the water in Can terms of... Oh yeah, we are talking about concentrated solar thermal power, you know, the parabolic rim collectors which heat the water and run the turbines. It is about double the cost of a kilowatt hour compared to photovoltaics today, but CSP has the advantage of being combined with solar thermal storage. So in my view, CSP and the future of CSP is only if you combine it with storage. And for me, the ideal solar plant is a plant where you have a core of mirrors, maybe a tower generator for solar thermal power. And during the day, this is all stored in the storage uh, facility. And you use during the day photovoltaic created uh, kilowatt hours for the daily use and in the night, you let the turbines run and you get 24 hour solar electricity. So this is really, in my view, the future of CSP. To be combined with PV, daytime electric power out of CSP actually is not cost effective, makes no sense. But nighttime electric power out of CSP is absolutely interesting and makes sense. Well, there's lots more hands going up, um, but unfortunately, Especially from your questions. I'd, I'd you like know. to so draw to a conclusion the formal talk. Um, I'd like you, first of all, to join me one more time and thank you. I can thank you. I'd like to thank once more our student group, our Material Science and Engineering yes. Association, for co sponsoring this. And finally, I would like to give you um, oh. a little memento of this particular visit. Thank you Europe. so much. In, uh, in, Cal in, in Freiburg, uh, we usually give bottles of wine and we oh, call this <laughs> stored we call the stored solar energy because wine is nothing but another form of storing solar energy. <laughs> but well, I'm glad that this is not wine because I couldn't take it with well, me. Well, since, since you live in Napa, we thought that would be like taking it. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. This is a shirt, so I appreciate this. And, and, and I the story of those shirts is actually that they're very special. Um, these will never be sold. Um, oh. They're a very hot commodity. Wow. You, you very nice. Yeah. You have to so you have to come here, give the talk, yes. You have to get those <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, if anybody here wants one of those shirts, you need to buy that. That's what I'm doing. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Great pleasure.